and the New Age movement. Uh, there's much more I could tell you, but I don't want to take any more time. You definitely want to get to spend some time with his, uh, his two daughters, Marin and Taryn, which are right here. They also have PhDs. But the one that's smartest of all is Jenity Martin, his wife, because she introduced Rebecca and I. So, sharp cookie. Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your grace tonight. Thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you that your word comes across uh, also in the creation story as well. That we can trust you. We know that uh, you, all your words are true. Uh, Father, pray for Dr. Martin tonight. Give him the right words. Pray that you would help us uh, to be good Bereans and take it to the word of God. And Father, we do pr continue to pray for Stanton Newman. That you would grant him grace, Lord. Great grace in their family at this time. I pray that you bring him back to health. And of course, we pray for Mary Howell as well. As she struggles terribly, Lord, in your own time, uh, take her home. In your son's name we pray it. Amen. Dr. Martin. We're glad to be with you all. And we used to come out here quite a bit when Bill McRae was here. Does anybody remember Bill McRae? Yeah, a few of you do. And he's one of my favorite preachers. S. Lewis Johnson, a little bit long ago, back in the 70s. And uh, so we're glad to be here. We have uh, on the back table, uh, we have my book, The Evolution of a Creationist, which kind of sums up the arguments from the Bible and science that moved me from being an evolutionist to a creationist. And we want every family just to pick up a copy. That's our Christmas present, okay? So they're back there. Uh, we can bring more next week if we run out. So just please pick that up. And then uh, we have back there also some boxes of our animal card gospel tracts. And so it, they all have a picture of an animal on the front. And then on the back, it talks about things about that animal. Like this talks about uh, Nudibranx and eye eyes and wetas. How many of you know about, know about those animals? <laughs> well, uh, see, we, we live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. So there's all these things you're not allowed to know about, okay? Um, we have one DVD. We'll, we'll, be bring, we'll bring some DVDs next week uh, that has the slow loris on the front cover. How many of you have studied the slow loris? Isn't that a shame? I mean, we go our whole life, we're not allowed to hear about these marvelous creatures that our Savior has, has created for our enjoyment and to give him glory. The slow loris is the only venomous primate. That's why you haven't heard about that. That doesn't fit the evolutionary scheme of things. You can't have a venomous primate. His venom glands are right here under his arm. And when he needs the venom, he just licks the gland, mixes it with saliva, that activates it. So we've, we've done 10 DVDs, all of them about animals that you've never heard of or animals that you have heard of, but you, you don't have any idea. I majored in biology in college. I never learned any of this, okay? All kinds of exciting things about these animals. So these animal card gospel tracks, they're so easy to use. So we'll talk more about that as we go. But if you want to pick up a box of those back there, by the way, we also have them in Spanish. So be sure to look at the, the top lip of the box because there's some Spanish back there as well as English. And uh, now tonight, we are going to look a little, well, I'm going to share a little of my testimony, personal testimony. Then we'll look at just a few kind of generalizations. Then I want to look at a few uh, video clips of uh, some things. One of them will be about Lucy. How many of you have heard of Lucy? Isn't that something? You all have heard of Lucy, and Lucy is a fake. But you haven't heard of the slow loris, and that's a real creature. <laughs> See, we're in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. And so we'll talk about that as we go. So yeah, I'll show you a video clip right off the Nova Science series about Lucy. And uh, the soft uh, dinosaur tissue, have you seen, anybody seen some videos of that? The, 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 they dug up a dinosaur, and it didn't have time to fossilize. 
And when they cut into the bones, they found elastic tissue, red blood cells. You haven't heard of that. See, that's 25 years ago. All right? We live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. If there's anything that spoils this fantasy of Big Bang billions of years evolution, you're not allowed to know about it. It'll never be on the Dallas Morning News front page, okay? So we'll be talking about some of those things. So first of all, we're, we're going to look at one basic question as we go through the next four weeks. I'm here four Wednesday nights. You might pray for me. At 6.30 tomorrow morning, we're leaving for Tennessee. And then, but we have to get back, so we're back for next Wednesday night. Well, we have to be back Monday night because we're in the Rockwall Community Band. And uh, so we'll be back by Monday night. Anyway, but pray, because they said maybe there's a storm coming in, and we don't want to drive in ice and snow. But anyway, we would appreciate your prayers. All right, now here's the big question. Who do we believe? Do we believe God, or do we believe people? That's the big question. Okay, do I prefer the words of God or the words of people? Now, that's the question. And I'm hoping you're going to start thinking about this as we go through these four weeks together. All right, now, just a little bit of my testimony. Um, yeah, who do we believe? Do we believe God or someone like Charles Darwin? Uh, we'll show you a little bit about him. Uh, anyway, we've got to firmly believe Jesus is the Creator. What's it say? God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of Jesus, created everything. So Jesus is the Creator. And what's it say there in John? It said, all things were made by Him. Talking about Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So since Jesus is the Creator, that gives Him the right and the authority to be the Savior, because only the creator of a particular organism could be the Savior of that particular organism, because that belongs to Him. And so our Creator is our Savior. What a wonderful thing. Now, I was raised in Pennsylvania. Anybody here from Pennsylvania? That's all right. I forgive him. <laughs> and, uh, and I was raised in the church. Actually, uh, my... Uh, my dad and mom were Methodist, and I was sprinkled when I was born. Then I took Methodist catechism. I was sprinkled again. Uh, still not a believer. I didn't even know. I'd never heard the gospel at that point. And then my mom left the Methodist church, joined a little independent Baptist church. And I'm sure they, they, they had some good preaching. All I ever heard was, you're not supposed to drink. This is my teenage years. You're not supposed to drink. You're not supposed to smoke. You're not supposed to go to movies. You're not supposed to play cards. You're not supposed to date girls that chew tobacco. I mean, that's all I heard. As well as, you got to tithe, and you got to be a member. So that's all I remember. So I didn't want any part of it, because I saw a lot of hypocrisy among these people that said they had this powerful God, Jesus. Well, I didn't see it. I didn't see it in the way they lived and what they did. So I, had not, I don't want that. So I went to Bucknell University. I majored in music and biology. In the Rockwell band, I played tuba. We got a timpani player and a bassoon player. And my wife would be playing bassoon too, so my daughter borrowed it. And uh, so I went there and I took one course in what was called organic evolution. In one week's time, I became a committed Big Bang, billions of years evolutionist, okay? Went off to uh, University of Pittsburgh and became a dentist. And by the time I got out of dental school, 1966, height of the Vietnam War, I am part of the hippie generation. A couple of you are back there with me, I can see. And uh, by the time I got out of dental school, I was looking into Zen Buddhism which is all you ever do with that, really. You just keep looking into it. And uh, I was agnostic. Maybe there's a God. Maybe there's not a God. I don't know. I don't know. And I was an evolutionist. So here I am, raised my teenage years in an independent, fundamental Baptist church. By the time I get out of dental school, I'm an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist. So 
Went into the Air Force. I was a dentist for the 89th Military Airlift Wing from 66 to 68. That's the presidential pilots and crews, which was very nice because I dated my wife, who was in San Antonio. I was in Washington, D.C., and I dated with the presidential airplanes, Sabre liners and jet stars and all kinds of things, which was very nice. Thank you for your taxes back in those days. And, uh, but they had to fly, so they'd just say, hey, Doc, when, when do you want to go? So anyway, actually, how did I become a Christian? I was 27. Well, I go into basic training, Wichita Falls, Texas, all right, Shepherd Air Force Base. I'm sitting in the officer's club, drinking a whiskey and 7-Up. I'm a total pagan at this point, okay? And I decided to say a prayer to the God of the Bible. So I did. I don't know if he's there. I'm agnostic. I just said, okay, God, if you're up there, you're either going to see the wildest Air Force officer you have ever seen, or you're going to see, or you can show me the girl I'm going to marry. And I thought, whew, nobody heard that. I'm going out and live it up. So I walked off the base. They had put us, some of us in a motel. I walked in the motel. There's this girl talking on the phone in the lobby. And I said, whoa, she is beautiful. I'm going to get to meet her. So she hung up the phone. I walked over. I didn't even introduce myself. I said, uh, hey, if you're not doing anything tonight, why don't you come down to my room? Not a good thing to say. Okay. <laughs> I mean, even 56 years ago, it wouldn't mean what it would mean today, but it was still not a good thing to say. She ignored me completely, took off in the other direction fast as she could go. But next day, I see her on the base. She's a second lieutenant. I am a captain. And that meant she had to follow orders. <laughs> and I ordered her to salute me. So she saluted me. And then I ordered her to go out with me that night. And we both thought she had to. We're in basic training. We don't know, okay? So we went out that night. And I said, I'm going to marry you. This is our, I didn't even know who she was, really, okay? But I knew I was going to marry that girl. And it, she thought I was crazy, okay? Uh, but I did. I knew. And I thought, you know what? I think God answered that prayer. So I got to Washington, D.C. and decided, I think I'm going to go to church. So it's the first time I ever went to church that my mom didn't drag me there. Praise God, she did when I was growing up, okay? I walk in this church. On the way out, the pastor shakes my hand. Captain, is there anything I could do to help you spiritually? We had our uniforms on. We were at war, Vietnam. I said, well, yeah, anything you could do would help me. I'm zero, okay? So we just read the Bible Monday mornings, Matthew, Mark. Luke. Now I know who Jesus is. We read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not all on the same morning. We get down to John chapter 3. And we're reading John chapter 3, and it said, verse 16, for God so loved the world, bang. I mean, God just hit me in the heart. I was part of the world. I loved the world. I loved the things of the world. And it was like God was saying, hey, Joe, I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever puts their faith and trust in him will have everlasting life. I got down on my knees with a fellow named Charlie Warford, and I put my faith and trust in Jesus as my Savior. I became a Christian, and uh, I've been a Christian ever since, by the way. Once you really become one, you're one, all right? And then uh, I went from being an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist to instantly becoming a theistic evolutionist, which, by the way, is most people in the church. I still had my evolution and my Big Bang and my billions of years, and there never could have been a flood that covered the whole world and all those kinds of things, but now I believe in Jesus. So I'm a saved evolutionist at this point. So you can be saved and be an evolutionist, because I was. And... Uh, then I went into private dental practice down at NASA in Clear Lake City. My patients were the astronauts' families and the engineers for NASA and all those people. And by the way, we did land on the moon. <laughs> I won't get into that. Anyway, in 1971, I got offered a job to be a professor at Baylor Dental College, so we came up here to Dallas. And uh, 
I gave my first lecture on the evolution of the tooth, how fish scales moved into the mouth and became teeth. <laughs> I can't believe I believed that, but I did. <laughs> And uh, because that's what I was taught, and you're going to believe those professors, right? I mean, they have doctor's degrees and things like that. So yeah, I believed them. Well, after that lecture, scales became teeth, two of my students came up and challenged me. Now, I am this cocky, rookie professor, and I thought that was a great lecture, okay? And two students challenged me? They said, Dr. Martin, would you be willing to study creation science with us? We think the whole universe is about 6,000 years old. We think there was a flood covered this whole world about 4,400 years ago. Would you study that with us? I didn't even have to pray about it. I instantly said, I'd love to do that. What am I thinking? These guys are back in the Stone Ages. Don't they know the scientists have proven billions of years and all that? That's what I'm thinking, okay? So I said, sure, I'll study. So I did. And I'm studying my Bible, and they asked me to study the assumptions behind evolution. I didn't know there were any. I thought it was fact, okay? I didn't know how to spot the assumptions, the guesses, in the scientific literature. So these students had to teach me how to do that. You just look for certain words, like, we think, this probably, this suggests, there's consensus. We believe. You see those kinds of words, whoop, they don't know that one. Oh my, they don't know that one. Oh, by the way, Wednesday nights is usually exegetical type teaching. We're doing a topical study. If you're here thinking it's going to be exegetical type teaching, we'll have a little bit of that as we go, but it's topical. Okay, creation evolution issue, uh, just in case. All right. Um, so, um, and then they asked me to study some animals. And the first one they bought, brought me was a bombardier beetle. How many of you studied the bombardier beetle? Oh, good. How many never heard of a bombardier beetle? Oh, my, that's terrible. Okay. It's a little insect that shoots its enemies with fiery hot gases out of twin tail tubes. So they brought me the information about this little beetle. Dr. Martin, would you show us how evolution would explain where this bug came from and how it got all of its equipment? You see, when you start thinking about this, it's all or nothing. That little bug has all of its parts or it blows itself up every step of the way. First time it gets a chance to mix those chemicals like it's hydroquinone and, and uh, several others. They're go it's going to blow itself up unless it has a combustion chamber. Well, it does, okay, like asbestos lime firing chamber. So it doesn't blow itself up. But even if it had that and did not have somewhere for the explosive reaction to go, it still blows itself up. But it does. That's twin tail tubes. It can aim them out the side, out the front, okay. By the way, when it shoots, you, you can hear it. It's like a pop. But some professors at Cornell University put that in slow motion, and it's like a sequential pop. It's like, all you hear is just pop, but it's so fast, it's like, and they finally figured it out. Let's say this bug is here, and he's facing this way, and he sees a spider coming up fast, and he doesn't have turn, time to turn around and shoot out the back. So he just takes his gun turret and goes, mm, bang. Now, if it wasn't like, with his little tiny legs, he would just blow himself right out of the picture. But with that kind of a sequential explosive reaction, he can stand there and shoot. By the way, if, if a spider gets shot by a bombardier beetle, it will never again attempt to eat a bombardier beetle. You mean a spider has a memory? Yeah, they really do. All right, now the second animal they asked me to study was the giraffe. So I brought my giraffe. This is a bull's rib, okay? And there's this lady out, in, in a rancher's wife out in West Texas. She goes out and finds bones, and then she paints them to be different animals. So this is a bull's rib. I have a small cow's rib. That's Mrs. Giraffe. I have a baby giraffe, and that was a goat's rib, okay? And she does all kinds of animals. Well, anyway, all right. Let's think about this for just a minute. Does a giraffe need all its parts from day one? 
Yeah, it does. It's all or nothing. There's no room for evolution. You can't have a slowly evolving apparatus in the neck of the giraffe or it's dead. Now here's what happens. Here the giraffe is having a happy day and he has a powerful pump. It's his heart. And the heart of a bull giraffe weighs up to 25 pounds. It's like a big turkey in there. And when it squeezes, it shoots that blood up that long skinny neck against gravity and he's doing just fine. Now he's going to bend his head down and get a drink of water. And the big pump goes squeeze. But now, instead of pumping against gravity, he's pumping with gravity. And the heart goes squeeze, and the blood goes zoom down that neck and hits his brains and blows his brains out his ears. And he must be thinking, I got a problem. <laughs> when I bend my head down, I blow my brains out. I'm going to have to evolve something to fix the problem. Dead animals can't fix anything, okay? But of course, he doesn't blow it out. Why? Because as he bends down, our Creator, the Lord Jesus, built little, like little spigots, little valves in the artery that goes up the neck. And as he bends his down, head down, they close. Now, you can't have a partially evolved valve waiting to get the full valve there, or you got a dead giraffe, and your evolution of the giraffe is done. Okay, it had to be fully functional from day one. All right, but the problem is the last pulse of blood is beyond the last valve. And it's under enough pressure to burst the little arterioles in the brain, but it doesn't go into the brain. The last pulse of blood goes whoop under the brain into like a sponge. And it's called the rete mirabilis, or the rete mirabilis, some people say. And it gently expands the little sponge of blood vessels. He does, he does fine, he gets his drink. Now he sees a lion. By the way, let's say he sees a uh, zebra coming up fast. He just ignores it. But he sees a lion coming up. Oh, i got to get out of here. The lion wants to eat me. How does he know the lion wants to eat him and the zebra doesn't? You see, there's all these things in God's creation that he built into his creatures. All right. So here comes the lion. So he jumps up and he runs about three steps and boom, passes out. Not enough oxygen to the brain. So he must be thinking, hmm, I got another problem. When I get up too fast, I pass out and the lions eat me. I'm going to have to evolve something here to fix the problem. No, dead animals can't fix problems, okay? He had to have all the equipment from day one. You can't have a partially evolved giraffe. Only God can do that. I got off track here with my testimony. All right, let's get back to it. In 1982, I resigned my uh, position at Baylor Dental School and went to Dallas Theological Seminary. I suppose you've heard of that. And uh, majored in systematic theology. I wrote my thesis on the New Age movement in 1983, 1984, before anyone in the church ever knew about it. And uh, then, uh, since graduating, I was uh, commissioned as missionary to the United States of America. And, but we go all over the place. But we like it right here in our country. Does our country need missionaries? Well, who is it? It's you. Okay, it's you. With your people you live with, your family, the people you work with. We're God's missionaries, okay? All right. So we go around and we talk about the Lord Jesus and different things about worldviews and different things like that. But the whole idea is to get people to really understand, you know what? We have a Savior. There is hope. You know, this younger generation, they don't have hope. We talk to them on campuses. They don't have any hope. We have hope. And they need to hear about that. So I've been on both sides of the fence. Almost half my life, I was an evolutionist. This last half, plus a few years, I am a biblical creationist. Now, what's a biblical creationist? A biblical creationist believes the universe, the earth, the universe, is about 6,000 years old, and um, there was a flood. Covered the whole works, the whole earth, about 44, 4,500 years ago. 
And I'm going to try and show you some proof of that before we're finished over these next few weeks. Now, let's keep one thing in mind. God says in Isaiah 48, 11, I will not give my glory to another. Evolution robs God of his glory. It steals his praise. The whole purpose of evolution is to get rid of God. And I'll read you some of the quotes from the evolutionists before we're done. And they just come right out and say it, basically. Okay? Get rid of God. So evolution, then, is not a Christian kind of a thing, even though many Christians believe in evolution. One more little thing here. If the Laodicean church, Revelation chapter 3, is a picture of the lukewarm church of the last days before Jesus comes, then look what Jesus calls himself to that church. And, and we're in different churches every Sunday around the country. And the church as a whole is lukewarm or even little less than lukewarm as a whole. All right, Revelation 3.14. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen. Jesus calls himself the Amen. Well, that's a, that's a good name. If this is the last church before he comes back, Amen, that's the last one. Look at the next one. The faithful and true witness. The Laodicean church, the apostate church of the last days, doesn't even believe there's a faithful and true witness of God in the Bible. And then this last one, the, these are... Names Jesus calls himself, the beginning of the creation of God. Whoa. A lot of churches won't even let you talk about that issue. No, we don't talk about that. We don't believe that. No, we just don't believe it. So that's very appropriate, those names, for the apostate church of the last days. So we need to have conviction. We can believe what the Bible says about origins. That's kind of what we're coming at here over these next weeks. All right, just quickly, in Psalm 19, if you would like to turn to Psalm 19, uh, Psalm 19 gives us uh, three basic things. It gives us the first six verses are general revelation, okay? General revelation, and that is the creation. Then uh, it moves on, so here we go. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. All you have to do is look around. How did that happen by accident, you see? Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God has displayed himself through his creation all over everywhere. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The, um, the evidence of a creator is everywhere you look here on planet Earth. All right, so that's the first six verses. Then um, it, from... Uh, Verse 7 through the first part there of 14 is God's special or his specific revelation, the written word, okay? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I hope your soul has been converted. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The wise, shakam, the skilled in godly living. So it's through God's word we learn how to be skilled in godly living. And now we have the indwelling of his spirit to enable us to do that. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. They really do. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. By the way, kind of the picture here is you have God's word here and you have a pile of gold over here. Which one are you going to take? See, that's the question. Which one are you going to take? And then he, he, something that tastes good, he says, 
Yea, the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Okay, you got God's word over here. And then you have the most delicious, sweet, wonderful tasting thing right here. Which one are you going to take? See, that's what God is saying. What do you love? What do you love? All right, so he goes on. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned in keeping them. There is great reward. No, it's not a penalty to keep God's word. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me of secret faults. Yeah, we all have them. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Somebody could be sitting in here right now tonight trying to figure out this next sin they're going to be involved in. Let them not have dominion over me, and then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, that's a prayer, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So what goes on here? You have special revelation, God's word. General, excuse me, general revelation, the creation. That should make us think, huh, you know that giraffe has all those special parts. You know, I think there must be a creator, a designer. I think somebody must have thought that up and got it going here. There's got to be a God. Well, that's general revelation. Then that should drive us into the word, the written word. We're going to find out now about this God who is the one true God, and that should bring us to redemption. And that's kind of the layout there of Psalm 19. Redemption. I hope you're redeemed. Remember, man has value and worth because he's created in the image of God. If he was just the result of a mindless, random, accidental chance explosion, his greater value to society would be to die after producing a new mutation so that a higher life form could take its place. Thus, He'd have no more worth or value than a speck of blue-green algae. By the way, sometimes my computer turns off this projector. So if it goes away, don't let me talk too long before somebody says, it's not up there. And then we'll try and fix it. A big bang, now think about this. A big bang explosion could not create beauty, regularity, symmetry, law, order, design, predictability, love, music. Where do these things come from? If everything came from just some sort of a random, chance, accidental, non-purposeful, non-directed explosion, boom. And I'll be asking some questions about that as we go. No observable science supports the fact that random, chance processes produce things like love. Where does it come from? Chemicals don't produce that. See, God is behind all of these things. If, if, is evolution from Big Bang to molecules to life to man? Possible. Okay. What was here before the Big Bang? By the way, does anybody know? Now, there's a lot of ideas about this. They're all theoretical ideas. Okay. Nobody knows for sure what was here before the Big Bang that believes in the Big Bang. All right. So I'm at, the, uh, I'm at Northern Illinois University, and it was a bunch of astrophysicists and uh, other people, and they were giving me all kinds of trouble, because they were all evolutionists, big bangers and all that. And I said, okay, as, if I understand you gentlemen correctly, what you're saying is everything in the universe before the Big Bang was condensed down into an infinitely dense speck. And one of them says, no. I says, okay, what? It was an infinitely dense, invisible speck. That's what he said, PhD. I said, well, now I can't visualize that. So let's just say it was a, a speck. Okay, so it's all there, everything condensed down. I said, now, would this, would this speck have infinitely dense matter? Oh, yes, of course it would. I said, well, with infinitely dense matter, would there be gravity? And one of them said, oh, yeah, it'd be infinitely powerful gravity. I said, okay, what then made your Big Bang go kaboom and shoot it all out if infinitely powerful gravity is pulling it all in? You know their answer? We don't ask that question. I said, oh, you take it by faith. 
No, no, we don't have faith. You have faith, you religious people. I said, okay then, what made it go kaboom? We've said so. We don't ask the question. I said, well, then you take it by faith. No, they didn't. But anyway, where does information come from? It's non-material. You can't grab a piece of information out of the air and stick it in a gene. You can't take a gene and pull information out. Where does it come from? See, all the information in every single genome had to have been supernaturally put there by the God of all creation. How does inorganic become organic? What made dead chemicals come to life? What mechanism evolved matter into man? You show me something that works that way. There isn't. There isn't anything. Because God did it. How does evolution produce love and kindness and concern and emotions and all that? Okay, Colossians 2, 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain to any man. Could that be Darwin? Could that be Sigmund Freud? Beware lest any man spoil you. How? Through ph what was Darwin? He was a philosopher. He was not a scientist. He went to divinity school, okay? Philosophy and vain deception. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Yeah, God says, don't, don't let that happen to you. Okay, beware, be on the alert. Proverbs 14, 12 is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's called deception. And that's how Satan's world system works. It works on deception. And so, one of the biggest deceivers that ever walked on planet Earth was Charles Darwin. Here is his book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation or the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, I usually say, what was the name of Darwin's book? And somebody always says, Origin of Species. That's not the whole name of the book. There's the whole name of the book. By Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. But you're not supposed to know the whole name of the book. A matter of fact, in re more recent editions, like uh, this one, they don't even have the rest of the title on the book. Okay, why? They don't want you to know something. There it is again, Charles Darwin, Origin of Species, Introduction by Julian Huxley. This is the 150th anniversary of, where is the rest of the title? They don't want you to know the rest of the title. Why? Because Darwin was a hardcore racist. You're not supposed to know that <clears throat> because we are the racist. You Christian people, you're the racist. No, no, no. There's only one race on planet Earth, the race of Adam. By the way, they're tinkering with that quite a bit right now, with these chimera things they're doing and everything. I, I think maybe that's why it says there in Mark, we're to share the gospel with every creature. And I've often thought, does that mean share it with the dog? No. I think we're going to be walking among things that aren't really people. They're working on that. They're not really people. But we're not going to know that. So we share the gospel with every creature. Uh, that's what I think anyway. Anyway, Charles Darwin, descent of man. He proves, he proves his racism. He just lays it out. These, these, this group of people, they're the closest thing to the apes. This group of people, they're a little further away from the apes. And the supreme accomplishment of evolution, according to Charles Darwin, the white male. Much superior, says Darwin, to the white female. Why would any woman even read Charles Darwin? Okay? But that's what he says in that book. All right, Darwin was wrong. John Sanford was an evolutionist, became a creationist. He's studying the cell. He's studying genetics. He worked on the Human Genome Project. Uh, there were a bunch of things he knew Darwin, knew nothing about. Nothing had been published yet in his lifetime about cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, Mendelian genetics, mutations, DNA, biological information, population genetics, neurobiology, over 100 fields of science. Nothing was even published yet in Darwin's day. And then God finally revealed it to Christian scientists. Almost every one of those fields brought into the uh, awareness of everybody through Christian scientists. And that's a whole study, too. All right, so why do so many professing Christians then believe in various forms of evolution? I think John 5, 44 and 12, 43 kind of sum it up. What's it say? How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? We love the honor that comes from men. 
John 12, 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I don't want to stand up in front of a group of scientists and say, I believe this whole universe is 6,000 years old. They're going, oh, man, wake up. You're way back there in the Stone Ages somewhere. Come on. No, no, no. We don't want to do that. Academic pride. We love the praise and honor of people more than that that comes from our Savior, the Lord Jesus. By the way, political correctness is the opposite of biblical truth. When you come, it's, actually, it's cultural Marxism, and we've got some stuff on that too. All right, so from micro, from the smallest to the biggest macro, the universe screams. There's a creator, designer, super intelligence, a living God. Anything you study. Yep. The Bible says the name of the living creator God is Jesus Christ. It tells us that in John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1. So the creator is the savior. Now, I'm going to jump out of this and go to a couple of clips and we'll see if it works. Okay. I'm going to escape from here and I'm going to come over here. And then we're going to look at uh, Professor Krauss. He wrote a book. We all came from Stardust, Arizona State University. Okay, let's just see what happens now. Uh, the sound hopefully will come through. I lost it. This is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, but the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. Can you hear that? And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? And, and anyway. So that's the response of his class. And that's what our young people are putting up with in universities today. That's University of Arizona, or Arizona State. All right, now I'm going to try another one, and we'll see what happens. Uh, where do I go? I go here. Okay. And this one is going to be about Lucy. All right, this is Lucy. And this, hmm? What? Oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me? You can hear me. This. Yeah, but I'm, I'm leaving it there till we pick this up. All right, let me just keep moving here. My IT uh, group is working here. All right, let's see here. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, Can you but hear the it? shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's. By the way, it wasn't superficial. That's what it looked like, a chimpanzee. Which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But see, they need one of those things to start walking on two feet like a modern human. And they chose this one, okay? But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones have been fossilized. Now watch this. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossils. Now hang on a minute. Fossilization doesn't do that. Uh, what they say is, this skeleton was out here on the ground, and some sort of a wildebeest or something stepped on this pelvic bone and smashed it. And then here comes this mud flow or something across it, and miraculously pushed it all back together again. But it didn't look like what it was before. Now it looked like a chimpanzee. No, what they found was the... Uh, bone of a chimpanzee. That's what they found. But it can't be that because they have to have something walk on two feet. All right, now I've got a second clip that shows you how they did this. 
and I never can figure out how to get there. I think I do this. All right, now here's the second one here. Um, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. Now, wait. He just said it looks like a chimpanzee. That means it would work for a chimpanzee. Now he says it's an anatomically impossible. No, no. It is for a two-foot walking creature. Yes, it is, but not for a chimpanzee. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. Now, this is not an illusion. They're looking right at it, OK? <laughs> By the way, this is in the Nova Science series, okay? But all was not lost. He's gonna fix it. This is what they did to Lucy. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. <laughs> they found it in its natural shape. He's changing the shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. See, they found it the way it was before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Yeah. So all I had to do was fix it. <laughs> that is Lucy. She's supposed to be our first, the evolutionists claim, our first two-foot upright walking creature. And they had to alter the pelvic bone to prove that that's what she did. What they had was a pygmy chimp. And they altered the bone. Oh, yeah, look. And now she's everywhere, down here at the Perot. They got a special part for Lucy down there. The London Museum of Natural History. They have a special part for Lucy over there. And it's a fraud. And they know it. They made it a fraud, OK? Unbelievable. We live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. It's based on lies. OK, now I'm going to try another one. And I'm going to hit this up here. And I'm just going to show you, no, I think I might, no, yeah, I'm going to show you the whole thing. All right, if I can find it. i got to scroll. How do I get this up where I can read all these things? There's no arrow over here, is there? Oh, here it is. Here it is. It's too small. I couldn't see it. Okay, where is, okay, I'll show you the short one this week. I'll show you the long one next week. I want, to see, I want you to see some dinosaur tissue that didn't have time to fossilize, okay? This is Mary Schweitzer. Um, is it North Carolina State? I think it's North Carolina State. She is a theistic evolutionist. She believes in God, but she believes in billions of years. And she was the one that received the uh, pieces of dinosaur bone. See, a paleontologist, a fossil expert, when they find a bone, they keep it exactly like they found it. They don't want to in any way disturb it, okay? So it's unheard of for a paleontologist to get out a saw and start sawing through the bones, unless there's nothing else they could do. And with this one, it was out in Montana, and it was very remote, they couldn't get trucks in. It was a big T-Rex. They couldn't, the only way they could get it out was by helicopter. And the pieces were too big and heavy, the helicopter couldn't lift them. So they had to cut it, section it, so the helicopter could get it out. When they sectioned it, it smelled like decaying flesh. It's supposed, this one's supposed to be 68 million years old. When they sent it to Mary Schweitzer and she did her things on it, whoa, there's red blood cells. There's elastic tissue. So this little clip will show you some of the elastic tissue. Mary, Mary, when I was reading about this story, I was amazed that in some of the capillaries, when you went to, to pull them, they snapped right back. Are you amazed at the quality of these remains? Absolutely. Seven million years old, huh? It it's just doesn't seem possible. But yes, you can actually take the vessels, and they, they do have 
internal components. And so you can take... Whoa, 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 whoa. She didn't want to say blood. So she says internal components. Okay, because blood isn't going to last 68 million years. The probe and kind of squeeze those things out into solution and, and the, the vessels are fine. It's just, I, I can't explain it, to be honest. That's dinosaur tissue. Mary, Mary. Now, is that the first time you've seen that? Let me see how many hands. The first time he's... Almost everybody. Isn't that a shame? This has been out for 25 years. And because we live in Satan's world system, which is based on deception, you're not allowed to know about these things. Now, the researchers know. They're talking back and forth about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know what? Uh, we think that really wasn't uh, blood vessels in there. That was biofilm. Now, they've proven it wasn't with the amino acids, okay. Oh, well, it's because of the iron in the blood. That's what preserved it. Now, they've done the research. Nope, that didn't do it either. The dinosaurs were covered in the flood of Noah's day. They think this could last for several thousand years. Covered, protected, which it did. All right, so those were a few clips I wanted to show you tonight, and I'll show you a little longer one that shows them where they dug it out and all the original stuff that went on with that. So we'll, we'll, we'll find that one next week. I don't know where it went on this one. And uh, let me get this off of here for now. And ladies, don't forget where I was tonight, okay? So I will remember next week. Now, let's keep going here for just a little bit. Uh, is there a question at this point? Good. All right. <laughs> No question? All right. Genesis. Look what it says. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide. This is day four. To divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. We're going to come back to that. Okay. I mean, if a day in Genesis is equal to a billion years, how long is a season? See, in Genesis 1, God compares the word day to season and year. People say, well, those days are, could be a billion years each. Excuse me. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Oh, and by the way, he made the stars also. It's almost kind of like that. I mean, what kind of a God do we have? The, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, he made the stars also. Just on day four, poof. And some of those stars are, you can't even imagine how big they are. And, and, and they're all moving. And they're all moving in relation to everything else. When I was down there at the Manned Spacecraft Center. Um, see, there's these two ideas. Is it heliocentricity or geocentricity? Does the sun go around the earth? Or does the earth go around the sun, basically? Okay. So I ask the engineers with NASA, I said, is there any way that we could decide once and for all what is going around what? They said, because everything is moving in relationship to everything else, the only way we could know for sure was to get outside of our universe and look in. These are the scientists for NASA. Okay, back in 1969, all right, uh, he made the stars also. There's the ant nebula. I mean, beautiful things. We're just learning some more. We just got some more pictures with the new one that they just put up. Unbelievable. The things they're finding. Uh, you know, they thought before they put the Hubble telescope up, they found kind of the the edge of the universe. Then they put the Hubble telescope up. Oh my, it goes so much farther with so many more things out there. Then they put this new one up. They just got up here a couple months ago. Oh my, there's even, what does God say right there in Ecclesiastes? He says, we humans will never get to the beginning or the ending of anything. They thought they had the God particle when they found molecules. And then they found 
Electrons and protons and neutrons. Oh, those are the God particles. Nope, then, nope, then they found quarks and glue. Oh, those are the, now they think they found the God particle over there in the big CERN thing. Nope, nope, they haven't. They found little particles, smaller, smaller, smaller. Uh, the cat's eye nebula. Uh, you know animals that prey on other animals. Their, uh, uh, their eye has the, the slit-looking thing when you look at it, it goes up and down. Animals that are prey to other animals, theirs, that slit thing, goes across this way. Because that gives them a broader view on all sides, whereas this one gives them more focused view on the prey. Well, God did that too. You see? There's all these special things He's done about animals when we learn about them. Amazing. Now, Time is almost up. Um, this is Answers in Genesis, and you can get all kinds of these kinds of pictures from Answers in Genesis, free of charge, download them, put yourself together a, a, a program. Anyway, what do we do as Christians? We shoot at the issues, and we should shoot at the issues, but you never can get all the issues because they keep blowing up more balloons for us to shoot at, you see? They shoot at our foundation. Oh, you stupid Christians. I mean, you believe that book is God's word? That is so silly. Okay, yeah. And, and they shoot. But we're built on solid rock. There's a shifting sand. And we can shoot their foundation right out from under. And you know what's, what's going on right now in the evolutionary circles is they're really starting to study the cell and they're realizing, whoa, this is so absolutely unbelievable. Maybe it is designed. I mean, really, these are some of the leading evolutionists. They're starting to think that way uh, with God's cell. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can't let them shoot the Bible out from under us. We don't need to let them do that. It's truth. It's God's word. It's truth. The creator God of the Bible tells us, study what he's made, and we'll see irrefutable evidence that he exists. All right, Romans chapter 1. And we're going to pick up here next week, but I'm going to read through a little bit here. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I hope you're not. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first. Are you praying for the Jewish people? Are you praying for Benjamin Netanyahu? I mean, the gates of hell are prevailing against him. Pray for our Jewish uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters in the Lord that know Jesus. Uh, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. By the way, it's interesting. There's like three Pentecosts. Did y'all notice that? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down. To whom? Jewish believers. Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit comes down. On who? Samaritans. Half Jew, half Greek, half Gentile. Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit comes down on... Gentiles. It's fascinating. It's like a progression there. That was an aside. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith, and we do. And so does the wildest atheist. We all believe by faith in something eternal. You either believe by faith in eternal God or by faith in eternal matter or eternal energy. So every person on planet Earth has a faith-based world view. Romans 1.16, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, a certain kind of man, men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. They hold back the truth. They know something, and they will not tell you about it. Like the slow lures, or the wettest, or the... Neuterum, so the eye eyes. They, they won't tell you about it. Well, why? Well, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Why? Because they study what God has made. How do we know? Well, he says so. For God has showed it unto them. How? For the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, wait a minute. If it's invisible, that means you can't see it. That's the definition of invisible. God is saying we can see invisible things about him how? 
being understood by the things that are made. Oh, when we study God's creation, the things that he has made, we can see invisible things about him. Praise God. Even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, that's not a word for Trinity, but what all is included in, in the Godhead? Well, the Trinity is included when you think God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Can you see that in the creation? Well, what's the first verse of the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens. It's a dual noun. There's two. Atmospheric heaven, stellar heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right. We have one God, three persons. We have one universe. There's not parallel universes, according to the Bible. One universe made up of three things. Time, space, and matter. In the beginning, what's that? Time. God created the heavens. What's that? Space. And the earth. What's that? Matter. Now look at each one of those. Time. What is that? Past, present, and future. God created the heavens. Space. What is that? Three things with depth and height. And the earth. What's that? Matter. What's that? Three things. Solid, liquid, and gas. What are you? Body, soul, and spirit. I mean, what's a tree? Root, trunk, leaves. Uh, what's an atom? Major parts. Proton, electron. I'm a dentist. What's a tooth? Denim, cementum, enamel. What is music? Melody, harmony, rhythm. And it takes all three to make the one. Well, at least in music. Uh, the younger generation has forgotten that, I think. And it takes melody, harmony, and percussion to make good music. Uh, anyway, so we can see this idea of one thing that's really three things. Each of the three is individually itself, but yet it takes all three to make the one. Now, that's not a perfect picture of God and the Trinity, but it's an idea. And I think he tells us to think about that. So they're without excuse. So next Wednesday night, pray I'll be here. I won't be in a ice pile somewhere in Tennessee. Uh, we're going to get into that. And we're going to look a little bit more at the dinosaur tissue. And we'll be looking a little bit at the idea of how all this affects our biblical Christian world view. So I'll say a little prayer for us. Father, thank you that we could be together tonight. And I thank you for this uh, Roma people. I pray all of us, Father, will be thinking, okay, who do I really believe? Do I really believe God in his word? Or do I believe the words of man? What am I committed to? And Father, if someone is here and they never have put their trust in Jesus as their Savior, I pray even today they would believe that their Creator, the Lord Jesus, is their Savior. And they would believe in Him. In Jesus' name, amen.